Hello everybody, this is Dr. Pennington and I wanted to talk to you guys a little bit about epoxides in synthesis. Now, you guys have seen epoxides before, you saw them in Ogle 1. Uh, now, there's no actual epoxide shown on this slide, but the overall goal for this uh, video is to show you guys how we can achieve a, comf a uh, synthesis like this. Plus EN, I'm hoping you guys understand means plus enantiomer because um, formation of an epoxide pretty much always produces two enantiomers unless it's completely symmetrical. So before we come back to this, we're going to go through a couple of other things. So, so let's look at this reaction first, okay? Here I have, this is the traditional epoxide. It's unsymmetrical because I've got a uh, methyl coming off here. Now what sort of reagent is this? Hopefully you guys can tell me. This is a Grignard reagent. It's essentially the same thing as saying I have that nucleophilic carbon right there, okay? So, if I was to ask you guys, well, what do you think would happen between these two? What is that nucleophilic carbon going to do? Or more importantly, where is it going to attack? Well, logic would dictate the carbon's going to attack one of the carbons connected to the oxygen, because that's most electronegative, which is absolutely true. But then the question is, well, which of these two carbons would it attack? Well, logic would also dictate them, well, they, this is a strong nucleophile that's going to attack the carbon that's most easily accessible, which in this case is this one, right? And if we do that, that goes up here, that, that breaks that bond. And what we end up with is the methyl group coming in here, that uh, bond breaking, forming an O minus, which then gets protonated by the water in the second step. So the functional group, I'm sure you guys can tell me that we get out, would be an alcohol, right? So if we, just to be on the safe side here, let's number our carbons. We've got carbons one, two, and three from the original epoxide, right? And I'm going to call the two carbons from the Grignard reagent A and B, all right? Now, can you guys see, I'm going to draw out carbons one, two, three again. One, two, and three. So if I just number those, one, two, and three. I don't know why I've drawn them so small, but you know what I did, so uh, get over it. Now, where is that alcohol going to be? Well, the alcohol is on the carbon that it was originally on. The, the epoxide was originally between carbons one and two. The carbon one oxygen bond broke, so can everybody see that alcohol is actually going to be on carbon two? But we're not complete yet because what is attached to carbon one? Well, it's the two carbons of the Grignard, which is carbons A and B. All right? And that essentially is um, how an, the opening of an epoxide with a strong nucleophile works. But notice I didn't, I haven't factored in any stereochemistry here, and I'm going to do that on the subsequent slide. But that's a basic idea of how the opening of a green of a epoxide works and this works with any strong nucleophile right so we can do it with the Grignard um, you could do it with you know something like cyanide there are lots of options for a strong nucleophile that you could do this with all right um, you know for example something that's a strong nucleophile would be something like methoxide. That would work as well. It's a strong nucleophile and a strong base, but we've got no basic, no elimination issues to worry about here. Okay, so let's go on to another one. Let's, let's look at this. You guys see we have an epoxide here. Again, this one's not symmetrical like, like the other one wasn't. But the difference is here, I'm showing stereochemistry in my epoxide. Can you see this shows that the oxygen is pointing above the plane of the ring, the methyl group on this carbon is below the ring. And if you look at what I've got for my two reaction products, I have what appears to be uh, two products that are clearly not the same as each other. Um, in fact, hopefully you guys can tell me what the relationship between these is. These are actually diastereomers. Uh, they're completely different products. Now, the, the fact is I can get to both of these products from the same epoxide. It just depends on what reagents I use. Right, So we're going to talk about the opening of epoxides via strong nucleophile and then via an acid. All right. 
So the first one we're going to do is, well, what happens if I use a strong nucleophile? The nucleophile that we're talking about in this case is OCH3 minus. So what if I was to ask you guys, this would be a process that looks something like this. I'd epoxidize, I'd open the epoxide with my strong base and that with my strong nucleophile, sorry, then I protonate the product at the end. Which one of these two steps or which one of these two um, reactions here do you think is used by these two reagents? Well, it turns out it's this one, all right? Now let's see if we can figure out why that's the case. Why do these actually go here and not up here? Well, let's just take a look. The OCH3- here appears to have attacked the least substituted carbon in the epoxide, right? Up here, the OCH3 has attacked the most substituted carbon in the epoxide. And with a strong nucleophile like this, you're always going to go for the least substituted case. All right. Now, what we end up with here is the OCH3- comes in, because the epoxide points up, the OCH3- OCH, blah, 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 let me start again. The OCH3- comes in from the bottom, and that's why it's shown on a dash. All right. This means that the, that the oxygen that was originally pointing up stays pointing up the product and protonates right there, so that's how we get that product, all right? This is only one of the two enantiomers that I could have formed when I formed this epoxide, so we don't have any other enantiomeric products here. Now, when we go over here, though, the reagents in this case are actually methanol and a strong acid, and for the strong acid, we're just going to illustrate H3O+, all right? So what do you guys think is going on here? Why is it that for some reason the epoxide opens here with the acid rather than with the strong nucleophile? Well, um, I'm not going to go through the mechanism here, but uh, that's, that's for a uh, different time. But the fact is that uh, it's all to do with the, with the transition state at here. Um, so because this is a tertiary carbon and this is a secondary carbon, uh, as the epoxide breaks open, your transition state is going to contain a carbon that's got a more of a tertiary feel to it than a secondary. And because tertiary carbocations are more stable than secondary, that's why the reaction proceeds this way. It's, it's kind of opposite to what common sense would make you dictate because you think well isn't it always going to break open at the site of the least substituted uh, part of the epoxide well ultimately it depends on the mechanism right you're going to protonate the epoxide first then the alcohol comes in but will attack at the carbon that's got the highest amount of positive charge which is the most substituted carbon and that's going to give you because the because the alcohol the methanol comes in from the bottom uh, and on this side, this bond breaks, leaving the alcohol up on the top here and then flipping that methyl group up. So this is how we get two different epoxides, right? Depending on what it is you want to do. It's anti-addition in both cases, as you can see, the OCH3 and the OH point opposite to each other, all right? But hopefully you guys can see that these two products are not exactly the same as each other. Now, that's going to take us back to where we were here. All right. We want to go from initially a compound that's got no functional groups in it at all to something that's got an OCH3 and an OH, which looks very similar to what we had here. In fact, it looks like we've got, we're ultimately trying to make this guy here. Oh, no, we're not. It looks like we're actually trying to make, uh, well, bollocks, which one are we trying to do? Well, either way, we can figure it out. But to begin with here, can you guys see that what we have in this case is a situation where we don't have any functional groups at all. There's only one reaction you guys have seen to introduce a functional group into a molecule where there isn't one at all. And you guys know that is the introduction of a bromine, right? Now, I apologize for my, that's, that's a really crappy looking ring. Let me try that again. Let me try not let me try and make a less crappy looking ring. All right. All right. So here is my benzene ring, not my 
bollocks. Here's not my bollocks, I'm sorry, no, that, that's not appropriate. Here's my uh, cyclohexane ring. I've put the bromine on there, and I do that via bromine uh, in the presence of either UV light or some sort of peroxide to make that radical reaction occur, right? So once I'm here, uh, if we want to do an, an epoxidation, because we know we want an epoxide at some point, do you guys remember what the functional group is we have to have in order to make an epoxide? Well, if those of you said alkene, you would be absolutely spot on. We need an alkene to make an epoxide. So how can we go from an alkene or from this alkyl halide to the corresponding alkene? Well, what sort of a reaction is this? Hopefully you guys can see this is an elimination. The only question I have for you guys at this point, is this the... Um, is this the Zaitsev or is it the Hoffman product, right? Well, it turns out this is the Zaitsev product. It's the more substituted uh, alkene product. So we can use a small, strong base for that. And something like ethoxide would work just fine. If we use the big bulky base, the T-butoxide, for example, see if you guys can figure out what the alkene structure would look like if we use the big bulky base. Now, to make an epoxide, what is that reagent that we use to make an epoxide does anybody remember we can write out we can just say some generic um, peroxide that would be fine the most common uh, oxidizing agent is the peroxide the peroxide called metachloroperoxybenzoic acid commonly known as mcpba and this is where we have to be a little bit careful with the product that we draw out because we're not going to get one product here. We're actually going to get two enantiomers. So we, we have to draw one product out and then say plus enantiomer afterwards. All right. Now, when we look at what we have here, the alcohol OH is always the one that was originally in the, uh, in the epoxide. So <clears throat> we're going to make sure we show the epoxide Dude, that's a crappy looking bond. That's supposed to be a wedge. It looks more like a wedgie than a wedge. Anyway, those are my two. Dude, that looks awful. Anyway, that's supposed to be my um, epoxide pointing up. And if the epoxide points up, I'm also going to have the methyl group pointing down. I'm also going to get the enantiomer here. Now, do you guys know what the enantiomer would look like? Well, the enantiomer would be where both stereo centers are flipped. So hopefully you guys can see the enantiomer would look, probably gonna look pretty crappy here, but it would look something like that, right? And the only issue with using this other enantiomer is that it's not gonna get us specifically to this product. So anyway, this is the important one. And then the question is, well, how do we go from here to here? Either we're going to open via a strong nucleophile or we're going to open via an acid. All right. Either way, we need some way to add in OCH3. So either it's the strong nucleophile OCH3 minus or it's the or it's the alcohol methanol. And of course it turns out it's the it's the alcohol. We have to use methanol in the presence of a strong acid. Because, can anybody see why, based on what we said earlier, why is it that we have to use the acidic opening? Well, it's because the OCH3 has added into the more substituted carbon of the epoxide, right? Anyway, so that's a little bit about epoxides in synthesis. I have one more thing that I wanted to show you guys. In fact, this works for any strong nucleophile, all right? How would I make something like this? Now, um, can you see there are no wedges or dashes here, but the assumption is in this product that the cyanide is anti to the OH. So they're added on opposite sides from each other. All right. Now, how do you think we could do that? Well, anytime we're going from an alkene to something that has two functional groups in it, one of which is an OH, 99% sure that's probably going to be via an epoxide, right? So it would be via an epoxide that would look probably probably something like this. Now again, I'm not showing any stereochemistry here, but this is just to illustrate the point. 
Can everybody see the epoxide I'd have before would probably look something like this, with the OH pointing down like it is here. The cyanide's going to come in from uh, the bottom, or from the top here. And cyanide, um, you can show CM minus if you want. You could also show sodium cyanide, it's the same thing. You can also show Na plus CM minus, it doesn't really matter. This is the active part of cyanide, all right? So that would just come in here, break that bond, all right? So this would be a, a one-step process and then the two-step process. The, the second part of this, what would the second part of this be? Anybody? Anybody? If I started saying Bueller, Bueller, would any have any, anybody have any idea what I'm talking about? Anyway, it, it doesn't matter. The second part would be protonation of the alkoxide that we get here. And then it's just a case of, well, how do we go from here to here? Well, this is a simple epoxidation, right? Just MCPBA. Or if you prefer some generic, some generic load of old bollocks, let me fix that. Some generic uh, peroxy acid, all right? I personally prefer this one, that's just me, but it's up to you guys. Alkene to epoxide, opening of the epoxide to um, the product, all right? We get plus the enantiomer here, just in case the cyanide was down and the OH was up, all right? But that's it. That's a little bit about epoxides in synthesis, okay? Thank you.